have one problem. The other 9900 don't even matter anymore. And my problem is being a logical person who keeps running into impossible things. I don't think this is unique to me. Running into bizarre coincidences, encountering experiences that can't be rationally explained. I think it happens to everyone that's paying attention. And so in this video, I'd like to take a look at synchronicity. Examples of it, what it is according to Carl Jung, the man who coined the phrase, and three possible explanations for this phenomenon. As usual, this will be a clusterfuffle of ideas that comes full circle at the end, so stick around for that part. And if you're feeling daring, you should like, comment, and subscribe right now before you even know what you've gotten yourself into, or if you're into it. Before we try to define the term synchronicity, I'd like to give some examples of it and just make a mental note of the words or phrases that come to mind. You are thinking about your best friend that you haven't heard from in a long time, and then you get a phone call from them shortly after. You dream about something before it happens. You see repeating numbers or symbols. You meet someone in one corner of the world and then years later bump into them somewhere completely different. You stumble on the exact person, place, or information you needed in order to move your life forward. Or any other coincidence that makes you think this can't just be a coincidence. Most people have at least one, but often many, of these odd experiences in a lifetime. If you have had these experiences, what do you call them? Like, what, what words or phrases do you associate with them? Because typically, people will fall into one of two camps. On one hand, there are people who would describe these events as fate, destiny, divine timing, divine intervention, signs from above. In the other group, they might use words like coincidence, serendipity, happenstance, chance, or my favorite, what in the actual and what Carl Jung was getting at with the principle of synchronicity is actually somewhere between these two camps, although closer to that first one. Synchronicity is the idea that what we call chance isn't always just chance. There's another force at play, uh, another thing, and Jung called this thing a causal connection. A causal being the opposite of causal. And causal, causality, is just a fancy word for cause and effect. So I strike a match, it lights a fire, I hit the brakes, the car stops, I pet a puppy, I'm filled with joy, I pick up heavy things, my muscles grow. So cause and effect, causality. And some people would say that this is the only force operating in our universe, that everything happens because something causes it, right? But Jung had a different take. He defined synchronicity as the coincidence in time of two or more causally unrelated events which have the same meaning. Right, so thinking about your friend and then getting a call from your friend. You thinking about your friend didn't cause them to call you, so they're causally unrelated, but the events share the same meaning. And this is why Jung also called synchronicity meaningful coincidence, because it's meaningful in more ways than one. It shares the same meaning, so the internal event being the thought of our friend and the external event being the phone call from our friend, they share the same meaning, being connection with our friends. It also feels meaningful to us, it feels significant when these coincidences happen, and it's meaningful in the sense that Jung believed synchronicity was proof of a divine order. He believed that spirit and matter aren't separate from each other, but are part of a larger whole, of a shared consciousness. We could also call it God. And this force, whatever you want to call it, consciousness, God, source, spirit, universe, it makes itself known in moments of synchronicity. Um, and that might sound crazy, but what's really amazing is that quantum physics is beginning to show that Jung may have been right all along. And so what I'd like to do now is look at a couple of examples of synchronicity from Jung's life and then look at it through the lens of uh, the skeptical lens of psychology, the woo-woo lens of new age, and the scientific possibility of quantum mechanics. As far as I'm concerned, Carl Jung proved magic exists, but for some reason Freud, his mentor, gets all the clout, and I'm pretty sure it's because Carl spent a lifetime studying these concepts that are brain-bending, and Freud spent a lifetime fascinated by his own penis. Go figure. But Jung was fascinated by synchronicity, and it was 
a lot of it was because of his own life experience. In, in the essay, book, essay, synchronicity, and a causal connecting principle, if you're interested, in this thing, he gives several examples of synchronicity from his own life, but my favorite is this 24-hour period where people just won't shut up about fish. And it may sound like a random coincidence, right? That all these people are talking to Carl about fish, but it's not. It's a meaningful coincidence, and here's why. At the time, Jung was studying fish symbolism throughout history. He had a very fishy fascination. And then there's this 24-hour period where he's just like, he's being Carl, right? Being a human, going through life. And his clients start talking to him about fish. He's seeing fish in, in paintings and in patterns. He's even eating fish for lunch. Like, what does it mean? Now you might hear that story and think to yourself, maybe Carl was seeing fish everywhere because he was obsessed with fish. It sounds like he has a fish fetish. And if you were thinking that, that's a very pragmatic observation. In psychology, this is a cognitive bias called the frequency illusion. And you've probably experienced it where you learn a new word and suddenly that word is everywhere. You see it on billboards, you read it in a book, someone is saying it to you. It's like this word is stalking you and you had never heard it before. It doesn't have to be a word. It could be a song, it could be a breed of dog you're thinking of getting, it could be a place you wanna move. It's just you get the idea of something into your head and suddenly there's a constant reminder of it everywhere you look. And the reason for this is that the human brain loves patterns. We are meaning-making machines. And this particular phenomenon, the, the frequency illusion, is the result of selective attention and confirmation bias. <clears throat> Got a frog in my throat. <coughs> Excuse me. Confirmation bias. Actually, let's, let's start with selective attention. So selective attention is this concept that we can only process a really small amount of what's happening in our environment. Uh, we are being bombarded by billions of bits of information, of stimuli, of data at any given moment, and we can only consciously process a tiny bit of that. And so our brain blocks out most of it and selectively pays attention to the things it thinks are important. And then there's the confirmation bias, and the confirmation bias is <laughs> where we essentially cherry pick things that confirm what we already believe. And so taken together, we get the frequency illusion. Uh, you learn that new word, indubitably, and it now has your attention because it's new. So when it comes up in the environment, you see it and it confirms what's already in your head. The truth is the word was there all along. We just didn't see it. And this is a really reasonable explanation for Carl Jung's fish fetish, for uh, seeing angel numbers. It can explain a lot of different kinds of coincidences, but it doesn't explain all of them. And I think Carl Jung's famous golden scarab story is a great example of that. So Jung was in his office with a client and she was telling him about a dream she had of a golden scarab. And at that moment, there's a ping on the window and Jung walks over and he opens the window and in flies a golden beetle. This can't be the result of the frequency illusion because what are the chances of a scarab flying into that office? Like maybe if you live in ancient Egypt or something, I don't know, they're like dinosaur bugs, right? <laughs> I should have looked that up before I started talking about it, but it doesn't matter. It could have been a grasshopper that flew into that room. It's amazing that as they were talking about it, it flies in, right? It hits the window. It crashed her therapy session. And we could call it a strange coincidence and leave it at that, but for anyone who's open to exploring the possibilities, and certainly anyone who has experienced a spiritual awakening, it feels like there's another layer to this. And there is, although whether or not it's spiritual is up for you to decide. This particular patient came to Jung looking for a psychological change. She felt very stuck. And when Jung met her, he was like, um, I don't know, because she was very rational. She was very stuck in her ways. And he felt that the only thing that could shake her out of this was something that was impossible, irrational, or inexplicable. He basically sat there praying for a synchronicity, for a magic coincidence, and that's what he got with that golden beetle. I, I should add this, by the way, because it relates to that last video, and I think it's important. 
what he was saying this woman needed was a shaking of the snow globe, right? To, to reference that last video. And that's essentially what a spiritual awakening is, is this crumbling of what we think is our reality. Jung was not a psychologist. He was a shaman in a psychologist's clothing. In any case, this beetle was exactly the magic coincidence he needed to blow her world open. And so when he literally handed it to her, he was like, here's your beetle. Maybe what he was handing her was her link between the physical and spiritual worlds. And so let's touch briefly on the New Age idea of synchronicity. According to New Agers, synchronicity is a sign from God, from angels, guides, from the higher self, that they are on the right path, right? It's a guidepost saying, go this way, you're aligning with your highest good. And regardless of whether or not that's true, I think it's interesting to consider the past two examples through that lens. So with Jung, and his fish fetish, what if his studies were pulling him deeper onto his destined path and that is why the synchronicities were coming up? Fish traditionally represents, you know, the deep waters of the unconscious, uh, swimming in deep waters, and that's where Jung swam. His entire body of work, his life, his legacy revolved around the unconscious. So of course he had a fish fetish, they're practically his animal totem, and with the golden scarab, Scarabs represent transformation and rebirth, the exact things that patient was looking for. The New Age beliefs about synchronicity are actually pretty similar to what Jung was getting at. Jung believed that synchronicity is often orchestrated in order to bring about healing and greater consciousness. It comes from the same place as the collective unconscious, this realm, this field that shamans and mystics and divination have historically tapped into. And <laughs> this is getting into a different topic. This is going to have to be its own series of videos, idea sex for another time, but hopefully this gets across the point that coincidence isn't always just coincidence. It could be proof of a deeper order of magic, of God, whatever you want to call it. And personally, I love this idea of synchronicity being like divine signs uh, because it's very like warm and fuzzy and that's just how I like to feel on the inside. But I also recognize that for a lot of people, it's too idealistic or too romantic to even entertain. It sounds ridiculous. <clears throat> and at the same time, I feel like that really clinical psychological view doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And so I wonder if there's a happy middle ground in, in quantum physics of all places. So <laughs> switching gears. In the beginning of this video, we touched on the laws of time and space and causality, and those apply at a macrophysical level, but when we get down to a really small level, to a subatomic level, they need not apply. A really small particle, like an electron, it appears as though it can operate outside of time and space. It can be in multiple places at once. Sounds like magic, but it's not. It's science, and this is where shit gets crazy. So in quantum physics, there is a phenomenon called quantum entanglement, and basically, what happens to a partner particle over here can affect a partner particle over there, even if over there is a billion miles away. We don't understand how or why this happens, but we understand the general process that two subatomic particles will come together and there's a linkage that takes place. They exchange information, they take on each other's properties, and after that happens, we can take particle B and we can fling it across the globe. And then we take particle A and we change something about it, say we make it spin counterclockwise instantly, particle B will start to spin counterclockwise. This happens so quickly that it is either happening at 10,000 times the speed of light or it's happening outside of time space. Einstein, for the record, was not a fan of quantum entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance, which I think is a funny way of putting it. But it's worth noting that uh, Einstein and Jung were contemporaries. They had conversations about synchronicity. And Einstein actually inspired Jung's principle of synchronicity. Einstein turned the world on its head when he showed us that time and space are relative. What Jung is proposing is that spirit and matter are relative. Let's look at it this way. At some level, the particles in our universe appear to be operating outside of time space. We'll look at a couple of examples to drive this home. So back to that earlier example of you're thinking about your best friend because you haven't heard from them in a long time and later that afternoon, you get a phone call from them. This is a causal because you thinking about your friend didn't cause them to call you. It could just be a coincidence. But what if your friend calling you is what caused you to think about them? 
their phone call and your thinking of them are like particle A and particle B connected across time space. Now let's take a look at a really mind-blowing example of how psychic phenomena could be related to quantum entanglement and we're gonna do it using data. So a man named Roger Nelson is studying what he believes is our global consciousness and basically what he's done is set up points all over the world that measure human emotional activity. Whenever something happens, an event that affects us collectively, deeply, emotionally, he sees a spike in his measurements and the single biggest spike he ever saw, this gives me full body chills to talk about, the single biggest spike he saw was 9-11. This is the graph. The, now here's what's puzzling. The actual event, the crash into the towers, that happens here where the box is. Our global emotional activity started to rise the day before the planes were hijacked. And so when we think of how quantum particles operate outside of time space, suddenly something like remembering forward isn't such a stretch of the imagination. I wouldn't be surprised if quantum entanglement could explain why some people feel instantly familiar to us. I wouldn't be surprised if quantum was the reason behind all psychic phenomena because psychic is really just science that we don't understand yet. When I set this book down, my thought was true coincidences are rare, but synchronicity is everywhere. And I think that if what we're talking about on this channel is real, right? So synchronicity, the collective unconscious, claircognizance, astral projection. If this is real, I would be willing to bet that this is the final frontier. It's not space. Fuck space. Consciousness is the final frontier. When we are able to bridge the intuitive and scientific realms, I think we're going to find that magic, God, is real. It's been us all along. One consciousness manifesting its infinite possibilities. But idea sex for next time. Another time. Next time, I'm not sure what we're going to get into. If we'll get deeper into Jung and the collective unconscious, if we'll jump off to astral projection and the pineal glands, it's all connected, but I have to think about it. In any case, next time I will be filming from my new home in the Yavapai Valley, which is 30 minutes from the metaphysical capital of the US where you cannot throw a magic crystal without hitting a mystic. Exactly my kinds of weirdos. If you're that kind of weirdo, or if observing those kinds of weirdos are interesting to you, like, like a zoo attraction where you don't really want to be in the arena, but you want to stand outside and watch. In either case, consider subscribing because my hope is once I get settled in Sedona, it won't just be me talking at a camera for 15 minutes, but <clears throat> actually interviewing the people who, who live this stuff. So lots of stuff to look forward to. Um, and until next time, heed the synchronicities and stay blessed. So what do we think of, am I gonna sneeze? Are you gonna sneeze? Nope, I'm thinking about it. Okay, it's gone, damn it. Oh, I hate it when that happens. You know, you, you release endorphins when you sneeze, so it always like feels really nice. And I'm kind of bummed when I get cheated out of a sneeze. Anyway.